Hello everyone, welcome to Anna Academy's YouTube channel. Uh, let me check if the stream is coming up in YouTube or not. After that, we will start with the class right away. But let me check if the stream is coming up. After that, we will start with the class right away. Okay, so everyone, the stream is coming up in YouTube, everyone. So let's start with the class. Let's start with today's class. See, in today's class, we are going to look at current affairs that are important for the mains examination which are very important for the mains examination okay so moving on uh, before moving on to the class itself let me give you a brief introduction about myself as well as about an academy see uh, my name is Aravind I have completed my BE mechanical engineering in 2014 and I have almost three years of experience in teaching UPC civil services and I have also experienced all stages of UPC civil services that is problems mains as well as interview now my specialization subjects include polity international relations as well as current affairs now this is my telegram link okay an academy underscore aravin now in this uh, telegram uh, group i will regularly update the schedule of my classes when i will be taking classes all those things so please do consider joining this tele telegram group in case you want to know more about the schedule of my classes or if you want to ask doubts regarding my classes you can join this particular telegram group now what will you get by subscribing to an academy see by subscribing to an academy one you will get access to daily live classes now in this daily live classes you get to watch your live classes and then you can re-watch your live classes and then if you have any doubts you can ask your doubts then and there itself okay now this rewatchability feature is very very important why because Whenever you are preparing for a competitive examination, you will be feeling the need to revisit your old classes mainly for uh, clearing your doubts or to rev for revision purposes. But with in a traditional uh, coaching setup, you cannot do that. But with an academy, you can rewatch your old classes. And also, an academy conducts live tests as well as quizzes so that the student they can test themselves based on examination point of view. See, when it comes to UPC preparation, fifty percentage is. Uh, studying and 50 percentage is practice so practice is as important as studying itself so that practice part will come via live tests and quizzes i mean all courses in an academy are structured courses so the lesson will properly flow from a to b to c okay so that the structure will be much more in tune towards examination syllabus and then the students will also find it much much easier to study stuff if the courses are very structured in nature and then by subscribing to an academy you will get unlimited access to videos concerned with the examination that you are subscribing for for instance if you are subscribing for upsc examination you will get unlimited access to videos concerned with upsc examination okay now i suggest you guys download this an academy learning app to keep track of your learning goals how much time you are spending with an academy all these things can be kept a better track if you are downloading an academy learning app and not only that, if your favorite teacher is about to take a class via an academy, you will get immediate notifications via an academy learning app. Okay. Now, an academy serves as a platform where almost hundreds of top educators they teach UPSC within an academy. Now, these are some of the most experienced faculty in uh, UPSC field for the past few years. And by subscribing to an academy, you get to learn from all these top top educators. Okay. Now, uh, not only this topic, not only uh, they are very famous for teaching and UPSC. Uh, since there are number of educators, if you are not satisfied with one educator, you can immediately switch over to another educator. For instance, if you are not if you are learning quality from educator A and you are not satisfied with his class, you can immediately switch over to another educator B. Okay, so, so this is the advantage with an academy. If you are not satisfied, you can immediately switch over to another class. Okay, so. With Anna Academy, there are a number of top educators like Sushan Vijar, Mudit Gupta, Ashish Malik, Ayush Changi, Roman Saini, all these people they teach uh, in Anna Academy. Okay, so please do consider subscribing for Anna Academy. Alright, so these are the amounts charged by Anna Academy for uh, uh, various months for plus subscription. Now, this is very, very less compared to any other offline institutions where you'll be spending upwards of 4 to 5 lakh rupees on things like fees, food rent but with an academy you won't be spending a dime on either food or rent why because you'll be learning from your home itself even the fees part is 
very very less okay on top of very paltry sum that an academy is charging you if you are using my code aravind v if you are using my code aravind v you will get 10 percentage as offer you will get 10 percentage as offer instead of paying 49500 rupees for one year you will be paying only 44550 rupees all right so please guys don't forget to use my code aravind v in case you are planning to subscribe for an academy now even with iconic platform where an academy will assign you with a personal coach now this personal coach is some of the most experienced faculty in UPSC field and some have even cleared UPSC itself. Okay, so they know all about how to clear UPSC, what kind of struggles students will face when they are trying to clear for UPSC, all those things. Okay, so based on their experiences, they will try to uh, solve your problems. All right, and then with an academy, uh, you get uh, what is it? Uh, you get access to daily mains question and answer practice almost on a daily basis so that you get to practice based on mains point of view and then uh, the academy will give you a study planner based on your preferences and then they will also give you personalized feedback based on your performances all right now even here with iconic platform if you see my code aravind v you will get 10 percentage as offer all right now, see here, Anna Academy has recently introduced, Anna Academy has recently introduced uh, courses on optional subjects, courses on optional subjects, almost 18 plus optional uh, subjects are, are being taught as of right now. Okay, so please guys, uh, do consider subscribing to optional courses as well along with GS course, okay. So these are the amounts charged by Anna Academy for uh, optional uh, courses. Even here, if you are using my code Aravind V, you get 10 percentage as offer you get 10 percentage as offer okay so please uh, do use my code aravind v in case you are planning to subscribe for any other uh, subscription platform abina yes abina you should be ready for mains before prelims itself yes that's the uh, that is one uh, thumb rule with uh, uh, mains examination within uh, immediately after your clearing prelims how much time will be there there will be only Three months within three months you can't possibly learn both you can't possibly learn everything about mates especially optional subjects so that's why with before prelims itself you should be very uh, you should you should study for mains okay and you should be thorough with your main subjects you can have some uh, subjects like internal security uh, all these things you can uh, revise after uh, prelims but most mains is actual examination abine not prelims okay keep that in mind okay now, if you like my class, please do uh, consider subscribing to YouTube channel and uh, click the bell icon as well as notification and don't forget to use my code Aravind V in case you are planning to subscribe for an academy. All right. So let's move on to today's class. You know, let's move on to today's class. The day one. Now, these are the topics that we will be looking today. Now, if you wish to watch these videos daily, don't forget to subscribe to an academy's YouTube channel. Now, the topics that we will be looking today is RTA amendment bill. So in this topic, we will look at uh, what are the provisions that has been amended in this recent RTA amendment bill, and we will look at various provisions of Forest Rights Act, and we will look at what are the implementation problems with respect to this particular act, and we will look at what are the highlights of this financial stability report, and we will look at uh, the details about cholesterol drug and what are the problems associated uh, with administering cholesterol. And uh, nextly, we will look at the scheme called as Pradhan Mantri Lagyu Vyapari Mandan Yojana. And the next topic that we will be looking today is national rubber policy, particularly vulnerable tribal, uh, particularly vulnerable tribal groups, investment models, aquaponics, as well as gravitation lensing. So these are the topics that we will be looking today. And lastly, uh, which I forgot to mention here, uh, we will also be talking about Increasing strength of Supreme Court. Clear. In la the last topic that we will be discussing today is increasing strength of Supreme Court. Clear. So let's move on to the first topic. The first topic that we will be discussing today is RTA Amendment Bill 2019. See, RTA, Right to Information Act, was originally passed in 2005. Okay. Now, what what is this act concerned about? See, RTA Act concerns itself with access to information, access to information to common people 
from government agencies clear via rti common people can access information from government agencies so uh, in what way he can access information public what he can do is he can write a letter he can write a letter attested with revenue stamp attested with the revenue stamp asking for information for day regarding particular project or particular uh, uh, government process any information he can ask to a particular government agency now this government agency will appoint a person called as public information officer that all government agency has to appoint a person called as public information officer now this public information officer is responsible for disseminating information whichever information that is asked by the public so that's how rt act works now uh, before moving on to the amendment process itself let's first look at what are the various provisions which are which was given in the original act itself see the parliament has passed right to amendment act the uh, right to amendment bill 2019 which seeks to amend section 13 16 as well as 21 to 27 of rta act 2005 now we will look at what are the provisions that was included originally in section 13 16 as well as 25 now these sections as per original rta act of 2005 see section 13 of original act provides for terms of office and conditions of chief information commissioner and information commissioners to it cic shall hold office for a term of 5 years from the date from which we enter this office and shall not hold office after the attained age of 65 years clear so this section 13 clearly defines what is the tenure of chief information commissioner it says that the tenure of chief information commissioner is 5 years from the date of him entering the office and also he cannot continue office beyond the age of 65 years also section 13 states that salaries allowances and other terms of service of chief information commissioner shall be the same as chief election commissioner and those of information commissioner shall be the same as election commissioner clear so this act clearly defines that the terms of office of chief information commissioner is the same as chief election commissioner whereas in case of information commissioner it is the same as election commissioners clear now why is these two provisions very important why is this section 13 as well as uh, section 16 very important see whenever you are uh, studying a body uh, whenever you are studying that a body is a type of autonomous body an autonomous body requires certain conditions to be fulfilled to be called as autonomous body for example there are number of bodies which works under the government like uh, uh, comptroller or general of india cgi uh, Central Vigilance Commission, Election Commission of India (CBI). See, Central Vigilance Commission as well as CBI, they are not autonomous organizations. Whereas in case of CGI as well as Election Commission of India, they are these are autonomous organizations. Now, what are the conditions required for a body to be called as autonomous body? Now, these conditions include one, the terms of service, the terms of service of that particular office should be clearly defined either in con- constitution or parliament by law clear the terms of service like uh, uh, that person by holding this particular op- office what are all the privileges that this person will enjoy what are the what are the uh, information that this person can access from government agencies so what is the relationship between this particular uh, person and other government agencies these are called as terms of service now this terms of service should be clearly defined either in constitution or parliament by law and also his tenure also should be fixed by either constitution or parliament by law and another one is his salary should also be fixed by either constitution or parliament by law now why do you, why do you think these three things are very important now if you take away these three things from a particular organization from particular office what will central government do if this particular office is acting against the interest of central government what will they do they will immediately transfer this person to another post so the autonomy of this particular organization will be compromised so that's why these three provisions are very important for independent function of any institutions clear Now, Section 16 of Original Act deals with state-level information commissioners as well as state-level information commissioners. It says that the term of term of state-level 
the chief information commissioner as well as information commissioner at 5 years so this section 16 said said uh, says that the term for state information commissioner as well as state chief information commissioner that tenure is for 5 years and they should not hold office beyond the age of 65 years as well as salaries that are payable to state chief election commissioners is almost equal to election commissioners whereas in case of state information commissioner it is equal to the top chief secretary of that particular state government clear so these are the provisions that has been defined in section 16 and also section 27 provides for power of central government as well as state government to make rules for smooth functioning of rta act 2005 Okay, so these are the original text that was given in RTA Act with respect to Section 16, Section 13 as well as Section 27. Now moving on, what are all the amendments that the current uh, Act has been passed with respect to these three sections? Now the first thing is the amendment proposes that the appointment will be for such term as may be prescribed by central government. Now in the original text, the term was given as Five years. Now they have amended this provision, saying that central government can appoint chief information commissioner as well as information commissioners for any term that is prescribed by the central government. So, if central government wishes to appoint a particular person for say three years, they can do so. If they want to appoint a person for uh, say uh, seven years, they can do so. So, it's at the uh, whims of central government to appoint uh, a person to uh, whichever tenure possible. also this amendment proposes that salaries allowances and other terms of service of chief information commissioner and other information commissioners shall be such as may be prescribed by central government now in the original text it it said that it's almost equal to chief election commissioner as well as election commissioner now they have amended this provision and they have said that it's equal and it's uh, prescribed by central government clear Now the proposed bill has removed the equivalence of CIC with CEC. As I mentioned before, uh, office of chief information commissioner is the equivalent of chief election commissioner. Thus, this equivalence was removed in this amendment process. Amendment bill. This makes chief information commissioner vulnerable to be removed by central government, as CEC can be removed only on the same manner as that of a judge of supreme court. Clear. Uh, in in previous scenario, if uh, central government wants to remove chief information commissioner, he can do so only by means of uh, uh, by, by means of the process of removing judge of supreme court. But this provision has been removed. So, if central government wishes to remove this particular chief information commissioner, they can do so. And also by amending section twenty seven, the central government will also control through rules the terms and condition of appointment of. Commissioners in the state. Clear. Now, this uh, section twenty-seven uh, in original text it mentioned that both central government as well as state government can make laws with respect to smooth functioning of uh, RT Act two thousand five. Now, this section was amended saying that central government can also control state governments with respect to appointment of state information commissioners. Clear. So, this if you look at these amendments. what is very clear it is very clear that central government wants to take away the autonomous powers from the chief information commission clear now what are the critics of this particular amendment see all the provisions related to appointment were carefully examined by parliamentary standing committee before passing the original rta act see before uh, passing the original uh, original rta act this rta act went to parliamentary standing committee now what is the job of parliamentary standing committee parliamentary standing committee will carefully examine clause by clause what are the various provisions of a particular act they will analyze what is the impact of this particular clause now based on uh, their analysis they will amend the text of uh, a particular act based on recommendations of parliamentary standing committee after that it will be presented to lok sabha now this original rta act was carefully examined by parliamentary standing committee now at that time parliamentary standing committee felt that since information is a kind of fundamental right which is guaranteed in constitution of india it is very important that the institution which is carrying out this function should be autonomous from the functioning of central government so that's why 
institutions like CVC, Chief Information Commission, uh, Chief Election Commission, as well as Lok Sabha, CAC, these are given with autonomous functions. Clear? Now, security of tenure ensures not only independence of working in the commissioners, but also independence of the institution overall from outside inference. Now, I'll give you one example. Two years before, there was a CBI director called as Alok Verma. Okay, there was a CBI director called as Alok Verma. Now, mind you, CBI doesn't have any autonomous powers. CBI is completed under the control of central government. That's why Supreme Court in numerous times have commented that CBI is, is a kind of caged parrot working in, under the whims of his master, that is central government. Now, there was a CBI director named Alok Verma. Now, this Alok Verma wanted to investigate the, the then BJP government with respect to Rafael scandal. At that time, there was a lot of allegations against the government with respect to the purchase of 36 Rafael aircrafts. Now, CBI director wanted to investigate into this particular scam. Now, obviously, central government got very angry and they removed this person from CBI director saying that this person indulged in corrupt practices. Now, what does this show? This shows that as soon as this particular institution CBI started to question central government's uh, involvements, they removed this particular uh, person itself. So it undermines the institution itself. It under undermines the institution of CBI itself. Now, subjecting Chief Information Commission the same process as CBI, it threatens the democratic functioning of CIC. Clear? Now, CIC cannot function independently. So if any information commissioner says that this particular RTI act should be entertained by the government of India, information should be revealed to the public, government can say that this person has indulged in corrupt practices, so we are transferring this person from CAC to another department. Clear? So if any, uh, if central government becomes comfortable, they can change the personnel of CAC, which is very dangerous for democratic functioning of institutions. Now, the deliberate change in existing framework of RTA Act empowers the central government to unilaterally decide the tenure, salary, allowances, as well as other terms of services of information commissioners, both at center level as well as state levels. So, central government has been given the power of appointing uh, any person if they want to in central information commissioner. So, what will they do? They will appoint persons who are favorable to the current central government. And also, the manner in which the amendment has been pushed through without any citizen consultation, bypassing examination by standing committee, demonstrates the urgency to pass these amendments even without proper parliamentary scrutiny. See, uh, if government wants to pass any important bill, what they will do is, before, uh, before as soon as they table in a particular uh, uh, parliamentary house, either Lok Sabha or Raj Sabha, what government will do is that they will publish this bill in Gazette of India. They will publish in Gazette of India. Now, what is the reason why this bill has been published in Gazette of India? So that common people, common people as well as eminent persons within uh, India, they can comment on this particular bill. Yeah, they will give, give some opinion on what are all the problematic provisions in this particular act. All these things, they will look into that and they will give some suggestions to the central government. Now, all these suggestions will be taken by parliamentary standing committee. Clear? As soon as a bill has been laid to looks either Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha, this bill will be published in Gazette of India. And as soon as this introduction, this bill will be sent to parliamentary standing committee. Now, this parliamentary standing committee, they will examine various proposals, various feedback given by the citizens of India with respect to that particular bill. After examining these criticisms, they will amend the text of that particular bill. Only after that, this bill will be allowed to pass. Clear. Now, this entire process has been skimmed through. This was not for this shows that uh, the uh, government which has been which passed this particular act does not want to follow democratic process. Clear. Also, amendments under RTA will weaken democratic institutions. Clear. Now, the next uh, topic that we will be looking is Forest Rights Act of 2006. 
see the main aim of this act is to correct historical injustice that was made towards forest dwellers see india in india forest cover is almost 22 to 23 percentage that is 22 to 23 percentage of uh, land cover of india is occupied by forest now in these forest lands traditionally scheduled tribes as well as other forest dwellers has been residing in these areas now the problem with these people is that they don't have adequate land records showing that these people have been residing in this particular area so right from 1952 present day in the name of development in the name of development various governments have taken away lands from scheduled tribes as well as other forest dwellers in the name of constructing dams in the name of uh, part taking in mining activities so in the name of development they have snatched away lands from scheduled tribes as well as other forest dwellers now the scheduled tribes as well as forest dwellers they rely on forest for their livelihoods as well as income so if you are taking away their lands what will happen they will suddenly lose out on their livelihoods and since these people are not well educated enough they cannot survive in mainland india they don't they don't have they don't have necessary life life skills to survive in mainland india so that's why these people are right for recruitment for naxal movements okay so if you look at one of the reasons why naxal movement uh, grown in, in india especially during 1970s as well as 1980s because of increasing in mining activities because of increasing in mining activities lot of livelihoods of forest dwellers was destroyed because of that only they joined towards naxal movements now this act aims to correct those historical injustices that was made towards scheduled tribes as well as forest dwellers now this act recognizes and vests the forest rights and occupation in forest land in forest dwelling scheduled tribes as well as other forest dwellers who have been residing in such forest for generations but whose rights could not be recorded since these people don't have any sort of uh, land records this act aims to provide some records saying that these people have been residing in for this forest for this amount of time clear so that's the purpose of this particular act now who are all eligible to claim rights under forest rights act of 2006 primarily people who are residing in forest as well as forest lands and who are dependent on forest as well as forest land for livelihood Further, either the claimant must be a member of scheduled tribe or in that area or other traditional forest dweller that is must be residing in forest for almost 75 years. And for these people, title rights which will give rights, relief as well as developmental rights for these people. Also, forest management rights and various other community rights will be provided under this particular act. So, what are the rights that will be given? Title rights, relief as well as developmental rights, forest management rights and also other community rights will be given to these people under this act now what is the process of recognition of these rights okay to grant this right there should be certain process right now what is that process the first process is first year the first process goes through grama sabha now in grama sabha grama sabha will form a committee called as forest rights committee now this forest rights will committee will comprise members from around 10 to 15 members this forest rights will committee will come constitute members around 10 to 10 to 15 members now this 10 to 15 members they will receive proposal from various people who are residing in forest they will collect various proposals from number of people they will examine these proposals based on their screening they will prepare a proposal clear they will prepare a proposal now in this proposal it will contain the names as well as families who who deserves recognition from government now this proposal will be sent to second year now this second year comprises of taluka level committee now this called taluka level committee will scrutinize first they will scrutinize after scrutinization they will approve this particular proposal they will approve this particular proposal after approval this approval will be set to third year in third year that is in district level their rights will be recognized and these rights will be implemented that is the proper land records for these particular lands will be given to uh, scheduled tribes as well as other forest dwellers and lastly 
there is another type of uh, committee called as a state level monitoring committee now what is the purpose of the state level monitoring committee now the state level monitoring committee will oversee the implementation of forestry act over the entire state now it, it will look at whether this uh, district level committee is functioning good whether perfectly or not whether all these proposals are looked into or not all these things will they will monitor clear so this is how uh, forest rights act will be forest rights will be recognized clear under this forest rights act of 2006 now what are all the challenges in implementation of forest rights act of 2006 the first one is deficient gram sabha now tell me what are all the areas that require uh, recognition of forest rights usually areas that are in interior parts of india that is forest which are covered in forest now these area in these areas people are already people are under developed under developed that is they don't have any they have less education as well as health indicator so they don't they don't have any knowledge on the workings of uh, any legal process on any bureaucratic levels so what is gram sabha what is gram sabha gram sabha constitutes of all eligible electors of a particular village or panchayat that's gram sabha gram sabha comprises of all electors of a particular village or panchayat so if gram sabha is a congregation of all people in that area the, those people in forest area don't have any necessary knowledge in this particular uh, legal process so the knowledge level in, a, in that particular gram sabha will be very low clear okay. so if their knowledge level is very low how can they efficiently prepare proposals how can they uh, effectively uh, ask for their rights uh, against state government as well as uh, district administration they cannot do that right since they don't have adequate knowledge they cannot do that so that's why in these areas they have deficient gram sabha which itself is a huge problem now the next one is lack of regular elections in panchayats clear okay. even though constitution under uh, 73rd amendment act has mandated that mandated that panchayat has to be conducted every 5 years it has to be compulsorily conducted but in practice that's not the case take the case of recent uh, uh, tamil nadu panchayat elections in tamil nadu panchayat elections has been dragging along for almost 3 years Uh, it was dragged on for almost three years. Only after around three to four years, panchayat elections was conducted last year. Okay. Now, in implementation, there are there have been number of instances where panchayat elections was not conducted or delayed. Also, there are there has been lot of ambiguity in the for, uh, formation of forest rights committee. Now, this forest rights act does not define what is the eligibility required for members uh, who can sit in forest rights committee. since there is a lot of ambiguity in that particular selection process what uh, president of the particular gram sabha will do he will appoint persons who are favorable to him who are favorable to a particular section of community so this ambiguity in formation of forest rights committee uh, committee itself is a very huge problem yeah and also there is a complexity of process see here for uh, rights to be recognized uh, see how many process a proposal has to go through it has to go through three tiers so in all these three tiers this proposal can be subjected to corrupt practices since there is a lot of complexity involved in the process itself this uh, this will become challenge in a implementation process and also illiteracy among tribals tribal people are some of one of some of the most illiterate people in uh, indian uh, indian continent now if they are illiterate they cannot uh, demand for their rights properly so that itself is a very big challenge in the implementation of forest rights act of 2006 and also poor administration as you all know what district administration is usually riddled with corruption and delay in process all these problems now because of this poor administrative setup in indian uh, government forest rights act in most number of cases is not implemented properly and also lack of land records as a proof now in my previous slide i talked about lack of land records on the part of uh, forest people but in india lack due to lack of digitization of lack of digitization of land records lack of digitization of land records and also proper uh, lack of proper maintenance of land records taluka office itself does not have proper land records now in that case rights cannot be properly recognized for these people okay yeah. 
now that's it with regards to uh, uh, forest ice act i hope everything was clear with respect to this particular topic now if you have any doubts with this topic you can ask in the comment section i will try to answer all the doubts okay now we will move on to the next topic that is financial stability report now this report will be released by an organization called as rbi now uh, excuse me now the next topic is financial stability report a financial stability report is released by a body called as rbi now what is the purpose of this uh, report now this report will assess the stability as well as performance of various financial institutions in india basically banks as well as other non banking financial institutions or the other institutions which they partake in financial activities so it will assess the stability as well as performance of these various financial institutions so that's the purpose of this financial stability report and this report is released by organization rbi okay. now this topic can be asked in prelims and the highlights that i'll be mentioning in this uh, video can also be used in mains answer writing yeah so if uh, in mains they have asked question regarding uh, non performing assets you can take information from this financial stability report financial stability report and you can quote that information in your mains answer writing clear yeah. in when it comes to mains answer writing most of the people know some basic points with respect to that particular answer now what sets apart from persons who are clearing mains and persons who are not clearing mains is the persons who are clearing mains will write specific information they will quote information from reports they will write some uh, important schemes uh, for that particular topic all these things they will write that clear they will mix objective information as well as subjective information now these two, two things has to be mixed together now for that this topic is very important in the perspective of mains answer writing clear now what are all the highlights in this particular report now there is a, there has been a general decline in gdp growth in the year 2017 to 2018 clear there has been a sorry 2018 to 2019 there has been a general decline in growth rate in this particular calendar year now the reasons for this decline in growth rate is because of decline in investment rate as well as consumption expenditure now these two are considered to be the main drivers of gdp in india because of the decline in these two parameters gdp has slowed down now the gdp is expected to pick up in 2019 uh, 2019 20 calendar year for that government must focus on reviving private investment demand at the same time remain vigilant about global economic slowdown clear okay. now obviously due to uh, covid pandemic covid pandemic indian economy is expected to contract in this current fiscal year now the next highlight is decrease in gross npa now the gross npa has declined to 9.3 percentage in march 2019 now the gross npas of public sector banks also registered a decline of unpresently stands at 12.6 percentage clear the collective gross national npa for the entire country uh, which includes almost all banks has declined to 9.3 percentage but for the public sector banks it has declined to 12.6 percentage now what does it say nps of public sector banks is higher compared to private sector banks clear now this information can be asked in prelims also gross np np of all scheduled commercial banks may come down from 9.3 percentage in march to 9.9 percent 9.9 percentage in march 20 2020 now uh, the gross np is expected to fall further from 9.3 to 9.0 clear now, the next highlight of this report is increase in credit as well as deposit growth so uh, what are the functions of main two functions of bank the main two functions is credit as well as deposits credit means giving out loans and deposit means public uh, depositing their money in banks now these two activities are seen an increasing trend clear now the next one is increase in net income of scheduled commercial banks now the scheduled commercial banks net interest income growth improved to 16.5 percentage in march march 2018 as compared to 15.9 percentage in 
when uh, September uh, 2018. Now, despite higher growth in their operating expenditure in March 2019, as compared to September 2018, scheduled commercial banks were able to maintain positive earnings. So, despite increase in expenditure, scheduled commercial banks uh, were able to maintain their positive earnings. Now, the next one is provision coverage ratio. Now, the provision coverage ratio for all scheduled commercial banks increased sharply from 52.4 percentage in September 2018 to 60.6 percentage in March 2019. Now, what is this provision coverage ratio? See, let's assume there is a bank A. Now, this bank A is giving out 100 crore worth of loan. Now, out of this 100 crore worth of loan, 50 crore worth of loan is good loans and 50 crore worth of loan is bad loans. Now, this is good, bad, bad, sorry, this one is good loan, this one is bad loan. Now, according to provision coverage ratio, bank A has to set aside 50 crore worth of money which can compensate for 50 crore worth of bad loans. So, how much amount is there in bad loans? But the bank has to set aside that amount for provision coverage ratio. Clear? Now that is called as provision coverage ratio. The next one is capital adequacy ratio. Now the capital to risk weighted asset ratio improved from 13.7% in 2018 to 4 2019 after recapitalization of public sector banks. Clear? Now what is uh, capital adequacy ratio? Capital adequacy ratio, the definition is tier 1 capital plus tier 2 capital divided by risk weighted assets into 100 clear now this capital adequacy ratio is defined by basel norms now currently we are following basel 3 norms based on basel 3 norms for all other uh, banks around the world basel 3 norms is set at 7 to 11 percentage capital adequacy ratio but for uh, indian banks it is set at 12 percentage the lower the number it is better. Now, what is the reason why this capital adequacy ratio was set? After 2008 financial crisis, Basel wanted to curb uh, speculative investment that was taken by number of banks and also uh, they wanted to reduce number of risk taking uh, ventures. So, to uh, avoid all these things, this particular uh, provision was uh, introduced, capital adequacy ratio. Now, according to this capital adequacy ratio, all banks have to maintain 11 percentage CAR. But for Indian banks, it is RBI has set, a, set CAR at 12 percentage. Clear? Improvement in asset quality. Bank wise distribution of asset quality shows that number of banks having gross national IPA have come down from March to come down in March 2019 as compared to September 2018. This implies a broader improvement in asset quality. Bank wise distribution of capital adequacy indicates that there are more banks having capital adequacy ratio at more than 12 percentage in March 2019 as compared to September 2018. So, these are the highlights that has been mentioned in a financial stability report. Okay. Now, this information, this information can be asked in prelims examination. So, I just uh, have a overview on all this important information. Okay. Excuse me. Now, the next topic that we will be looking today is the drug cholesterol. See, this drug cholesterol is a antibiotic drug. Antibiotic drug. Now, this cholesterol has been is being widely used in poultry sector in India. And it has been widely recognized that indiscriminate use of cholesterol in Indian poultry industry is made one of the main reasons for increased antimicrobial resistance in India. Now, what is this antimicrobial resistance? See, uh, right from World War I, when antibiotics was introduced, antibiotics is the cornerstone of modern medicine. Yeah. Now, antibiotics is used for treating any type of infection. For example, if you have any type of wounds, the first thing that uh, doctors will prescribe is antibiotics. Or if you have any type of uh, high fever or cold, and if you have any sort of internal infection also, antibiotics will be prescribed to you. Now, what is the purpose of this antibiotic? To kill bacteria. Okay. 
Now, whenever you have particular infection, doctor will prescribe to take you uh, take antibiotics for prescribed number of days. Say, for example, uh, five days. Clear. Now you have to take this particular drug for five days so that you kill this bacteria effectively. Clear. Now, what will people do? So, as soon as they started to uh, show improvement in, in their health indicator, what, what what will they do? So for example, I am taking antibiotics. So, my doctor has prescribed me to take this antibiotics for five days. Now, in two days itself, I have recovered completely. So, I will stop taking this antibiotics. What, but what will it do is, this bacteria that has been residing in my body will not die completely. So, instead, it will, this bacteria will re become resistant to this particular antibiotic, which I have not taken fully. So, based on this, this bacteria will be become to immune to that particular antibiotic. That's how antibiotic resistance will increase. Clear? Now, this antibiotic resistance continues to pose a serious threat to global health. While antibiotic resistance can evolve naturally, misuse of antibiotics in humans as well as animals has been blamed for accelerating the process. So, even though antibiotic resistance can be attributed to natural process, the process has been accelerated to because of indiscriminate use as well as misuse of antibiotics in both humans as well as animals. A World Health Organization has said that Cholestin is a reserve antibiotic which should be considered as a lost resort option. Only in lost resort we have to administer cholestin drug. But in India we have we have been using this drug indiscriminately in poultry industry. Now what is this cholestin drug? Now cholestin or polymyxin E is an old antibiotic which was first introduced in 1952. Now the drug has been used since 1959 for treating infections caused by gram negative bacilli which are responsible for various diseases such as plague, cholera as well as typhoid. Now what are the concerns with the cholestin? Now, the problem is that this potent antibiotic is highly misused in livestock industry in India to prevent diseases as well as to uh, promote growth in uh, poultry industry. Clear? The misuse of cholestin in poultry industries is said to be a major reason for increasing in antibiotic resistance in India. Uh, uh, cholestin is being used for growth hormones so that uh, poultry uh, grows faster and also they produce uh, more muscle in their body so that they can be uh, uh, sold for higher price. Now this practice has led to increase in antimicrobial resistance in India. Now this particular topic can be asked in prelims question. Questions can be asked like uh, the term cholestin has been seen in news recently. What is what is what does this term mean? This question can be asked. Number the, the number of questions like this have been asked in previous year's question paper. For example, last year uh, they asked a question regarding Himalayan metal plant. Yeah. So these type of questions will be asked in new problem. So please remember this stuff. Now the next topic that we will be looking today is national rubber policy, which was introduced in 2019. Now before going on to the topic itself, uh, let me give you a brief overview on rubber production in India. Okay. Before going under the policy, we will look into that. See, India is the sixth largest producer of rubber in India, but India is the second largest consumer of rubber in the world. Okay. So, what does it say? There is a disparity between production and demand. And because of this disparity, large amounts of rubber have been is being imported from other countries. Okay. And also, most of the rubber that is being grown in India, almost 81% of the production is being done by only two states. Those two states include Kerala and Tamil Nadu. There are other states like uh, Assam, Tripura, North Eastern states, Meghalaya, Odisha, Karnataka, as well as Maharashtra and West Bengal. This grows some, some amount of rubber, but the majority of rubber production is done in these two states, Kerala as well as Tamil Nadu. Now, what is the legal as well as institutional framework for rubber production in India? Uh, rubber Act of 1947 provides for the development of rubber industry under the control of union government. Okay? So, rubber production will come under the subjects of union list. Also, rubber board headquartered in Kotayam, Kerala under the administration of Ministry of Commerce and Industry has been effectively supporting the rubber industry. Now, this particular information is very important. Now, this information can be asked in prelims examination. For example, they can ask like uh, 
rubber will come under uh, rubber production will come under the ambit of which ministry so many people will think that rubber comes under agriculture the ministry is ministry of agriculture but that's clearly wrong the ministry that is responsible for rubber production is ministry of commerce as well as industry because in india rubber production is not treated as an agriculture practice rather it is treated as a manufacturing process okay rubber production in india is treated as a manufacturing process not as agriculture process and also for promotion of rubber sector government of india has allowed 100 percentage foreign direct for direct investment in plantation of rubber coffee tea cardamom palm oil tree as well as olive oil tree so apart from 100 percentage of tea which has been allowed in rubber plantations government of india has also allowed 100 percent in plantation of coffee tea palm oil tree as well as olive tree now moving on what are all the broad contours of national rubber policy 2019 status of natural rubber see according to this policy the government must explore the possibility of treating natural rubber as an agriculture product and the income of income from rubber production should be treated as agriculture income for all practical as well as legal purposes now what are the advantages uh, by classifying rubber production as agriculture process one such advantage is easy access to credit by rubber plantations towards from banking institutions so they can uh, if uh, rubber is being classified as agricultural production what we, what can, what are the benefits Plan, rubber plantations can get, get easy access to credit from banks and also there is no need for paying taxes to central government as well as state government if it is being classified as agricultural income okay. and also sustainability in production the next facet of rubber policy is uh, sustainability in production see there are the number one problem with respect to rubber production is that Uh, we have exhausted all land with respect to rubber production there is no more land that is available for rubber production rubber can be grown in only particular set of plants so particular set of lands now all these lands have been completely utilized now to increase this production sustainability of these particular lands as well as rubber is very important now for that purpose the domestic production of natural rubber should be able to meet at least 75 percentage of requirement in 2030 and hence the government must explore the possibility of increasing the area under rubber plantation particularly in the non traditional states okay so that's one thing the next facet of natural rubber policy is import export policy so the import of natural rubber has been has seen a significant increase over the years in this regard a policy has to be put out so that the import of natural rubber from other countries doesn't adversely affect domestic rubber planters okay so that's a policy which needs to be uh, further put out and also the brand indian natural rubber should be a uh, popularized so that this brand will be able to distinguish indian natural rubber from other brands of rubber so this brand of indian natural rubber should be popularized in other markets and also we should revamp institutional framework of rubber production as i mentioned before rubber production currently is being overseen by a body called as rubber board which has been established in kottayam kerala now we have to revamp this rubber board so that it gets aligned itself with best practices in global arena yeah. also productivity enhancement and the capacity of existing departmental nurseries under rubber board should be fully utilized for propagation of genetically superior as well as quality planting material so we have to uh, uh, substitute our natural grown rubber with genetically modified rubber so that the rubber production gets increased so this is the topic uh, this that's it with regards to national na, na, national rubber policy now if you have any doubts with respect to this particular topic drop comment in the comment section so i'll, I'll try to answer those doubts now the next topic that we'll be looking is pradhan mantri lagu vyapari mandan yojana excuse me now ministry of labor and employment has introduced a pension scheme for small traders called as pradhan mantri lagu vyapari bandhan yojana under unorganized workers social security act of 2008 now this scheme is an extension of pradhan mantri shram yogi bandhan yojana 
now what are what are the provisions or what are the advantages of this particular act now this act will be beneficiaries eligible for pension of rupees 3000 after the age of 60 years yeah. so it will give a pension for uh, people who are over the age of 60 years for lagu vyaparis now who are these people lagu vyaparis lagu vyaparis means people who are self employed working as shop owners retail traders rice mill owners oil mill workers workshop owners Commission agents, brokers of real estate, all these people will be considered as Lagu Vyaparis. Now, these Lagu Vyaparis are the backbone of informal sector in India. An informal sector constitutes a large chunk of GDP production in India. So, the welfare of this informal sector is very important when, when it comes to GDP, growth of GDP of India. So, that for the, uh, for the help of this informal purposes for working under the informal sector, this particular scheme was introduced. Now, what are all the provisions under this particular scheme? Now, for the purpose of, of this scheme, pension fund shall be administered by Life Insurance Corporation of India. The pension will be dispersed by LIC. Also, each eligible subscriber under this scheme shall receive assured minimum monthly pension of rupees 3000 after attaining age of 60 years through LIC. Now, once the eligible subscriber joins this scheme at any age between 18 to 40 years, such subscriber has to contribute till at any age of 60 years. Okay. There are two persons. For example, there are two types of persons who are willing to join this particular scheme. One person is of 18 years of age and another person is of 36 years of age. Now, even though these two persons belong to different ages, this 18 year person has to contribute to this particular scheme up to 16 years even this 30 year 30 year old person has to contribute till 60 years of age clear on attaining the age of 60 years subscriber shall be entitled to get assured minimum monthly pension of 3000 rupees with the benefit of family pension as well clear now what is the required eligibility for this particular scheme now this scheme shall be open to only lagu vyaparis for joining whose annual turnover does not exceed 1.5 crore. Okay. Lagu Vyaparis whose the annual turnover is less than 1.5 crore. Only these people are eligible for in this particular scheme. Okay. And this particular person should have a savings bank account as well as valid Aadhaar number. And also this Lagu Vyaparis should not be eligible, should not be less than 80 years of age and should not exceed 40 years of age. And also this Lagu Vyaparis should not receive any other pension for the benefit of for the benefit of informal workers this lagu vyapari should not receive any other pension for the benefit of informal workers only then only after uh, uh, meeting all these three requirements he will be eligible to this particular scheme okay now this uh, topic is very important from prelims perspective uh, schemes are in prelims each year almost three to four questions are coming from schemes or schemes is important not only from prelims perspective it is also important from mains perspective now whenever you are writing mains answer for a particular topic you can quote particular scheme saying that uh, this scheme was introduced for the benefit of these people to address this particular problem you can write uh, you can make your answers in means more subjective so that your answers will be uh, what to say you will elevate your uh, mains answer writing okay now the next topic that we will be looking today is types of investment models. Now this investment models is important both from prelims as well as mains perspective. In prelims perspective, number of questions can be asked from like what are the advantages of, advantages of this particular investment model and uh, what are the provisions of this particular investment model. All these questions can be asked. Now in mains topic, there is a separate syllabus itself under GS2. There is a separate sub syllabus called as types of investment models. Now, every year, every two years, you can expect a question from types of investment models. Now, in this topic, we will look at what are the types of investment models that are in existence in India. Now, the first type of investment model that we will be looking is public investment model. Now, in this type of investment model, if you want to undertake an infra project, for example, uh, if you want to construct a road between uh, Jaipur and Delhi. Now, in this, if uh, this project is a public investment model, the full revenue will be borne by the 
government itself. The complete revenue for this infra project will be given by the government itself. Now the government will source this revenue from raising taxes from common people. Okay, so that's how public investment model works. Now what are the advantages of public investment model? Now whenever if an economy is going through extended period of recession, if economy is going through that phase, what happens to private investment? Private investment will decline because of the recession. So in that time, government has to increase their infra infra infrastructure spending so that it, it is compensating the investment from private sector. Okay. So so that the government is enhancing the productivity of the nation. Okay. Now the properly targeted public investment can do much to boost the economic performance, generate aggregate demand quickly, fueling productivity growth by improving human capital, encouraging technological innovation as well as spurring private sector investment in by increasing return. So these are the advantages of having public investment model. Now what are the disadvantages of public investment model? Now government alone cannot undertake all infra projects. Government doesn't have the resources to do that. So that's why we require public investment model as well as private investment model. Clear? Now what is private investment model? Now for a country to grow as well as increase in its production investment, tax revenue of India is not adequate to meet the demand of the government. But now this uh, to meet uh, adequate infrastructure demands, private investment is also very essential. See right now it is estimated that every year India requires around 20 lakh crore worth of investment, you know, infra in investment that is to be spent on India. Now clearly government doesn't have the resources to spend all, all 20 lakh crore. So that's why government will spend some amount and also it requires participation from private sectors as well. Now private investment can be sourced from both domestic as well as international market. From abroad private investment comes from the form of FDI as well as FPA. Now the abbreviation of FDI is foreign direct investment. FPA is a abbreviation uh, is a uh, short form for foreign portfolio investment. Now in case of FDI, a particular private company from abroad will invest directly in, uh, will start a company and they will invest di directly in that particular company. Okay, this is called as foreign direct investment. But in case of FPI, they will invest only in shares of a particular company. They will not invest directly, they will not start a particular company. Rather than doing that, they will invest in shares of a particular company. So that's the difference between FDA as well as FPA. And also private investment can generate more efficiency by creating more competition. Okay. Now take the example of uh, car industry. There are a number of uh, car industry owner, car industry players in India like Hyundai, Honda, Suzuki. Now, this is the number of uh, car manufacturers in India. This is a number of car manufacturers. There is a competition between three car industries. Now because of this car uh, competition between these industries, what will they do? They will try to be as much efficient as possible so that they can uh, provide much value to the consumers. So private investment is very important for increasing efficiency in a particular economy. And because of that increased efficiency, uh, what, what happens? Realize, realization of uh, economic resources will be much more better compared to public investment. Okay. Now, Recently, uh, there has been an increasing trend towards moving towards public-private partnership. Now, why public-private partnership is required? Now, say for example, uh, government wants to construct road between Delhi and Mumbai. Okay. Now, government wants to construct dedicated freight corridor between Delhi and Mumbai. Okay. Now, to partake this uh, huge infra projects, private sector will not have any resources. Now, for considering these huge infra projects, private sector will not have any money. So, what private sector will do is that they will partner with government, okay? both private as well as government will come together and they will invest in this particular infra project. Okay? Now, there are a number of models to this public-private partnership itself. The one, the first one is build operate transfer model, build own operate model engineering procurement as well as construction model and the last one which was introduced recently is hybrid annuity model and the first type of public private partnership that we are going to discuss today is build operate as well as transfer model now this trans this type of ppp was widely used for construction of 
routes between 1990 to 2014 this model was used for construction of roads between 1990 to 2014 now this is a con conventional public private partnership model in which private sector is responsible for design building as well as operating this particular infra projects now this private uh, company will be given a lease period a lease period for, for which the, uh, this private company can operate this particular infra project after the expiry of this lease period they will transfer this infra project to government clear after the expiry of this lease period after they have recuperated all their uh, revenue from uh, their investment as well as generated profits of this particular investment they will transfer this infra project to government clear so this is the conventional build operate transfer model and also public sector will allow the private sector to partner collect revenue from the users the national highway projects contracted out by uh, national highway authority of india under people bodies the major example of pot model clear this is one type of ppp model next one is build own operate model of public private partnership now in this model ownership of the newly built facility will rest with the private party in the in the previous model the ownership is given to government but in the in case of build own as well as operate the ownership for infinite time will prevail will uh, reside with the company who is constructing that particular infra project okay but the difference between bot as well as uh, bvo is that on a mutually agreed terms and conditions public sector partner agrees to purchase goods and services produced by this project now this type of ppp model will be widely used in power sector for example a uh, lot of uh, for example adani group they want to construct solar farm in gujarat clear solar farm in gujarat now whenever adani group wants to construct solar farm they will operate under build own operate model now under this uh, model adani group will invest in the solar farm they get to own this solar farm but they will enter into an agreement between they will enter into an agreement between distribution company of gujarat saying that this distribution company should purchase power from the solar farm at a set price for this number of years okay. now this build own operate uh, model will be used for number of power sector projects okay. now this is one type of ppp model the next type of ppp model that we'll be looking is engineering procurement and construction model now under this model the financing is done by public sector only clear and uh, unlike uh, other models the financing is done by only public sector but what is uh, then uh, if financing is done by only public sector then what is the role of private sector now under this model the private players are responsible for engineering procurement procurement of raw materials as well as construction and receive lump sum money okay now this uh, Private sector are they are responsible for designing as well as constructing this particular infra project, but operating as well as getting to own this particular infra project rest with public sector. Now the private sector's participation is very minimal in this particular PPP model. Now the problem with this model is that high financial burden is placed on public sector. Okay. Now this is one deficiency of EPC model. Now this hybrid annuity model was recent, uh, introduced recently. Now, the, one of the reasons why this uh, model was recently uh, introduced recently because under BOT model, under BOT model, private sector has to invest a lot of money. Private sector has to invest all the money that is required for this infra project. Now, during 2014 to 2018, banks were under a lot of stress to give up loans to infra projects. And also, number of private companies were also lot of, under a lot of stress. They were not uh, generating additional revenue, so they didn't have a lot of money to invest in infra projects. So private sector was lacking in resources to invest in infra projects. So that's why government wanted to develop a new type of model called as hybrid annuity model. Now under this model, government finances 40% of for the project cost in the first five years through annual annuity. Okay. So government, if uh, for example, uh, the project cost is thousand crore government will provide 400 crore so for a set period of time for five years this 400 crores will be divided into a sum of 80 crores this 80 crore will be given by government annually to this particular infra project and private entity must finance the remaining 60 percentage 
Now, if you look at this particular model, it can it is very clear that HAM combines both EPC as well as build operate transfer annuity model. Okay. Now, in this particular model, public entity retains the ownership as well as operation by the private entity has to provide engineering expertise. HAM is gaining prominence for highway construction. Clear. Now, in case of build operate transfer model, the ownership initially was given to private sector, but in case of hybrid annuity model, the ownership is given to public sector, not to the private sector. But private sector will receive revenue from this particular infra project. The private entity cannot collect toll under this revenue is collected by National Highways Authority of India, but this toll will be shared between both government as well as private players. So that's the uh, specific uh, specifics of hybrid annuity model. Now this uh, model has been introduced recently and has been following widely recently for construction of highway projects. Clear? Now we will move on to sorry, this slide has been repeated. Now we will move on to the next topic. The next topic that we will be looking today is particularly vulnerable tribal groups. See, in India, the tribal population makes up around 8.6 percentage of total population. So, for example, if India has around 100 crore population, almost 8.6 crore population is tribal population. Now, out of this 8.6 crore population itself, some tribal groups are more powerful compared to other tribal groups. Even this among this tribal groups, there is a lot of disparity among them. Uh, even though tribal groups are some of the most marginalized communities in India, even among them, there is a lot of difference in developmental indicators. Okay. Now, among these tribal groups, particularly vulnerable tribal groups are more vulnerable among these tribal groups due to this factor, more developed and assertive tribal groups take a major chunk of tribal developmental funds because of which particularly vulnerable tribe groups need more funds that are directed towards their development. Yeah. If tri some tribal groups are more powerful compared to other tribal groups, what will these tribal groups do? They will assert more pressure on public institutions and they will receive more number of funds to themselves. Yeah. So that's why PVTGs require a lot more care compared to other tribal groups. Now considering this in mind, Government of India appointed a commission called as Dibar Commission in 1973. Now this Dibar Commission created primitive tribal groups as a separate category who are less developed among tribal groups. In 2006, Government of India renamed particularly primitive tribal groups into particularly vulnerable tribal groups. In this context, in 1975, Government of India initially, initially identified some 52 such tribal groups as PBTGs and also in 1993, some additional 23 groups have been identified as PBTG. So overall, there have been around 75 PVTGs identified by Government of India and there are around 705 other scheduled tribes. Clear? Now, how are they identified? What is the process of ident identification of PVTG? Now, for identification of PVTGs, the state government or union governments, union territory governments, they should submit their proposal to Central Ministry of Tribal Welfare for identification of PVTGs. First, state government will prepare a proposal. They will send this proposal to Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Now, uh, this Ministry of Tribal Affairs will ensure that this particular set of people will fulfill a certain criteria. If these people meet this certain criteria, they will be declared as PVTGs. Clear? Now, there can be question asked from this. Uh, for example, questions can be asked like, who has the power to declare a particular group as PVTGs? And options will be given like state government, central government, Ministry of Tribal Affairs, and President of India. Now the answer for this particular question is clearly Central Ministry of Tribal Affairs, not State Government, because State Government only prepares the proposal. They don't have the power to declare such groups as PVTGs. Okay? Now so far, 75 such tribal groups has been categorized as particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Now these PVTGs have been residing in almost 18 states, 18 states as well as union territories. Okay. Now, what are the characteristics that is required to be uh, declared a particular group as PVTGs? Now, these characteristics include, now these people should have mostly homogeneous and should have very small population. Yeah? And these people should be relatively physically isolated compared to other parts of India. And they should have pre-level technology of agriculture. So, they should rely mostly on 
hunting as well as gathering for their livelihood okay. so they should have pre level technology of agriculture and they should have also declining population now based on this criteria only central ministry will examine number of proposals and if uh, a group meets all these particular criteria then only they will be declared as pvtgs now this information is very important from police perspective among 75 listed pvtgs highest number are found in orissa okay. now what are the issues that are related to a uh, pvtgs now social conditions as well as declining population this is the first issue that is related to pvtg now as i mentioned before tribal groups are some of the most marginalized communities in india okay now even among them social conditions of pvtgs are very less compared to mainland india so they have very low social condition and also they have very declining population and their livelihoods is being destroyed because of number of developmental activities like mining dam construction highway projects because of this their livelihoods also are being threatened and health conditions of pvtgs are deteriorating day by day because they are getting exposed to mainland india uh, increasingly because of that they are getting exposed to number of new types of germs now because of that their health conditions are being deteriorated year on year now what are what are all the schemes that has been devised by government of india for the development of pvtgs and the first scheme that was developed by government of india is development of particularly vulnerable, vulnerable tribal groups scheme now this scheme will be devised by central government now now to implement this particular scheme state government will prepare conservation come development plan okay. this scheme development of pvtg scheme is developed by devised by central government now based on this particular scheme funds will be given to state government now the state government will, will prepare conservation come development plan and they will use these funds to implement uh, development activities with respect to pvtgs that's so that's how these schemes work okay. so that's it with regards to this topic now we will move on to the next topic the next topic that we will be looking today is gravitational lensing excuse me now why we are discussing this this particular topic now we are discussing this particular topic because nasa is planning to launch james webb space telescope in 2021 now this space telescope will use a natural phenomenon called as gravitational lensing to carry out astronomical observation okay now what is the purpose of this james webb telescope now this james webb telescope will study every phase in the history of or origin of universe ranging from first luminous glows after big bang to the formation of solar systems and this uh, this telescope will analyze what are the reasons why certain planets like earth are capable of sustaining human life and they will also it will also analyze the evolution of our own solar system clear now from achieving this objective nasa has launched a program called as targeting extremely magnified uh, panchromatic lens arcs and their extended star formation or templates now for achieving this objective nasa has launched this particular program so that it can aid this gravitational lensing program now what is this gravitational lensing see the phenomenon of uh, so now uh, i hope everyone watched this movie called as interstellar now in this movie one important information that was conveyed to viewers is that whenever grab whenever there is a body which is high of gravity whenever there is a, a body which has very high gravity when light passes near through this body light instead of following a straight line it will follow a curved path okay. whenever this body will attract these bodies are like a, have powerful gravity that they can attract light itself that's why if you look at uh, black holes and all black holes have infinite amount of uh, gravity if you look at that light will bend as well as then it will stretch in this particular black hole clear okay. so that's why uh, this phenomenon is called as gravitational lensing this uh, gravitation this phenomenon of gravitational lensing occurs when a huge amount of matter such as massive galaxy cluster of galaxies or a black holes 
create a gravitational field that distorts and magnifies the light from objects behind it. Now, this phenomenon is called as gravitational lensing. Now, this gravitational lensing is based on Einstein theory of general relativity. Normal lenses such as the ones and magnifying glass use a process called as refraction. Now, using this process of refraction, they will magnify uh, a particular objects. Now, using this phenomenon only, uh, so far we have considered telescope. Now, now this James Webb, uh, James Webb telescope is trying to use the phenomenon of gravitational lensing instead of refraction. Now, similar to refraction, gravitational field of massive object causes light waves to uh, bend as well as refocused, refocused somewhere else. Now, we, if, we cap, if we can capture this phenomenon, we can observe which bodies have been uh, causing this phenomenon. Now, based on that, we can study uh, bodies which are far away from Earth. Now, the more massive the object is, the stronger the, its gravitational field and hence the greater of bending of light rays. Just like using denser materials to make optical lenses result in greater amount of refraction. So, the greater amount of mass of the body or uh, bigger the black hole, there will be much larger amount of bend in the light rays. So, similar to the amount, similar to the denser materials causing greater amount of refraction. So, in effect, gravitational lenses act like natural cosmic telescope. Now, this effect of gravitational lensing allows researchers to study the details of earlier gallery galaxies which are too far away to be seen otherwise in traditional telescope. Clear? However, gravitational lensing is very rare as it requires distant star or black hole and observer on earth to be well aligned. Now, only uh, all, if all these parameters are being met, so we can observe uh, bodies through gravitational lensing. If it is not met, gravitational lensing is uh, very not very useful yeah? and also it can help astronomers to know more about black holes as well as dark matter so these are the uh, specifics with respect to gravitational lensing or uh, this question can be asked from prelims perspective see the next topic that we'll be looking today is aquaponics see aquaponics is an ecologically sustainable model that combines both hydroponics as well as aquaculture aquaculture so aquaponics it's a combination of both hydroponics and aquaculture. So, what is the combination of these things? See, hydroponics is the growth of plants in a soilless environment where soil is replaced with water. But in case of aquaculture, aquaculture is artificial rice of fish. Now, with aquaponics, both fish and plants can grow together in one integrated system. Yeah. So, it, uh, by comparing hydroponics as well as aquaculture, in aquaponics, both fish as well as plants can grow in a simultaneous environment. Now, the fish water pro fish produces waste. Now, this waste can be provided as organic food source for the plant, which in turn naturally filters water for the fish, creating a balanced ecosystem. Now, what is the requirement for plants to grow? Uh, it requires uh, organic food source. Now, this organic food source is given by fish and fish requires clean water. Now, plants will clean this particular water for fish. Now, the third participant is microbes or nitrifying bacteria which con converts the ammonia from fish waste, into fish waste into nitrates which is essential for plants to be able to grow. Okay. So, the third participant in aquaponics is my, uh, microbe, uh, microbe, uh, microbes. Now, these microbes will convert ammonia which is released by fish waste into nitrate nitrates which is very essential for plants to grow. Okay. Now, what are the benefits as well as disadvantages with aquaponics? Now, FAO has come up with a technical paper in 2014 listing all the advantages as well as disadvantages of aquaponics. Now, what are the advantages of aquaponics? Now, aquaponics can result in higher yields almost 20 to 25 percentage more compared to other qualitative production. Clear? Now, this aquaponics can also be used on non-arable lands such as deserts, degraded soil or salty sandy islands. Clear? So, uh, uh, traditionally desert lands as well as uh, salty, uh, salty lands cannot be used for cultivation of plants. But using aquaculture, we can use these lands into uh, cultivated lands. Clear? Also, this aquaculture uh, aquaponics creates very little waste compared to other traditional farming practices because uh, waste produced by fish is uh, used as organic food source to 
plants and plants also uh, will in turn aid the development of fish ecosystem yeah? so it creates very little waste compared to other farming practices now daily tasks harvesting and planting are cut down to great extent thereby saving labor and time both fish and plants can be used for consumption and income generation okay? so these are the advantages of aquaculture so aquaponics now what are the weakness of this aquaponics now these aquaponics are expensive initial startup cost compared with compared with other soil production or hydroponics so they they require much intensive capital cost compared to other farming practices and it also requires knowledge of fish bacteria as well as plant nutrition okay only if a person has all knowledge in all these three areas he can indulge in the himself in aquaponics and the optimal temperature range is required from 17 to 37 degree 34 degree celsius so number of areas in which aquaponics can be cultivated is very less mistakes or accidents can cause catastrophic collapse of system since this is a very closed ecosystem if any system is getting collapsed the entire ecosystem will collapse so any sort of small mistake or accidents can collapse the entire system itself daily management is mandatory also it requires reliable access to electricity fish seed as well as plants uh, plant seeds if used alone aquaponics will not provide complete diet okay so this is the weakness of this uh, aquaponics now uh, we will move on to the next topic increasing of strength increase in the strength of supreme court judges now recently union cabinet has approved the proposal to increase the strength of supreme court from 31 to 34 judges now in this topic we will look at uh, what are the reasons why this increase increased strength is warranted and we will look at what are the constitutional provisions with respect to increasing the number of judges in supreme court see here the cabinet has taken decision to increase the strength of supreme court from 31 to 34 judges which includes Chief Justice of India, Supreme Court number of judges at 1956 was last amended in 2009 to increase judges strength from 25 to 31. Now it has been amended recently in 2019. Okay. As per Article 124 Clause 1 of Constitution of India, the strength of Supreme Court is fixed by law made by the Parliament. Okay. So these are the provisions with respect to increasing the strength of Supreme Court judges. Now what are the reasons why we need increased strength in Supreme Court? one is rising pendency now between 2006 to 2018 there has been almost 8.6 percentage rise in pendency of cases across all courts all courts now because of this rise in pendency of cases we require increasing in number of judges also pendency before supreme court increased by 36 percentage high courts by 17 percentage and subordinate courts by almost 77 percentage in this period and low dispersal rate. The dispersal rate has stayed between 55 percentage to 59 percentage in Supreme Court, at 28 percentage in High Court, and at 40 percentage in subordinate courts. Now, because of this low dispersal rate, we require increase in strength of Supreme Court. Okay? Now, what are the constitutional provisions with respect to increasing number of judges in Supreme Court? Now, the strength of Supreme Court is dealt in Article Article 124. Now, what are the provisions that has been mentioned in Article 124? Now, this Article 124 Clause 1 states that there shall be a Supreme Court consisting of Chief Justice of India and not more than seven other judges until Parliament by law prescribes a large number. So, constitutionally, Constitution originally prescribes CJI plus CJI plus seven other Supreme Court judges. Now, if Parliament wants to increase this number, it can do so by passing law in the Parliament. Now, crucially, law, law that has been passed to increase number of judges to Supreme Court is not considered as an amendment to the Constitution of India. Okay? This is very important. The law that has been passed by the Parliament to increase the number of judges of Supreme Court is not considered as amendment to the Constitution of India. Okay? Also, 124 Clause 2 states that every judge of Supreme Court shall be appointed by President by warrant through his seal after consultation with judges of supreme court and high court in states okay? and also parliament is competent to increase the number of judges if it deems necessary as itself 
Now the topics that I will be teaching you today is includes nutrient based subsidy rates. Now in this topic we will look at what is the need for having nutrient based subsidy rates and what are the advantages of having nutrient based subsidy rates and then what type of problem we are dealing with. So all these things we will look at this particular topic. The next particular topic we will be looking is changes in prevention of money laundering act. Now uh, money prevention of money laundering act was passed in 2002 which was re amended recently. In this topic we will look at what are the amendments that was passed in this original act. So that's the topic we will be looking in this uh, video. The next one is five star movement. Now this five star movement is uh, ongoing in Italy. So we will look at to what are the origins of this five star movement and in what way this five star movement is very, very important from prelims perspective. And then we will look at this Genome India initiative. In this particular topic we will look at what is genome sequencing and what are the, what is the significance of genome sequencing and what are the advantages as well as disadvantages when it comes to genome sequencing and lastly we will look at academic locomotion now so this is this is a particular uh, floating nuclear power plant in this particular topic uh, we will look at what are the advantages of having floating nuclear power plant and which countries are currently pursuing this uh, this technology called as floating nuclear power plant and what are the advantages of having this particular technology okay now let's move on to the topic itself the first topic that we will be looking today is nutrient based subsidy rates see here fertilizer subsidy fertilizer subsidy is the second largest is the second largest subsidy in india apart from food subsidy uh, the uh, fertilizer subsidy occupies around it's the second largest subsidy that the government of india provides for the people of india apart from food subsidy so rationalizing this fertilizer subsidy is very important if we want to achieve the target of three percentage of fiscal deficit target which is set by uh, medium uh, medium term fiscal policy framework clear now when it comes to fertilizers there are number number of different types of fertilizers fertilizers like urea potassium as well as uh, potassium as well as for phosphatic based fertilizers do dom fertilizers there are number of different types of fertilizers but in india when it comes to fertilizer subsidy before fertilizer subsidy was given only for urea yeah fertilizer subsidy was given only for urea when it comes to urea sale a fixed monthly rate was fixed by the government of India. So uh, any industry which is uh, manufacturing urea can sell urea only at this fixed monthly rate. So if that fixed monthly rate is less than their profit, that uh, uh, that loss will be covered by the government in the form of subsidies. Clear. Yeah. So uh, when urea is only given uh, subsidy, what will happen? Obviously, urea price will be less compared to other forms of fertilizer. So, farmers started purchasing urea more and more, and they uh, they uh, used urea indiscriminately. Now, because of that, elements, nutrients which are highly present in urea, like nitrogen, potassium, these elements became very high in Indian soils. Because of that, uh, soils fertility becomes reduced. So what is the purpose of uh, using fertilizer so that we can enhance the fertility of particular soils. But after indiscriminate use of urea, the fertility of soil became very less because the nutrients, nitrogen as well as phosphate increased now uh, many fold. Okay. So that's why we wanted to rationalize this subsidy rates. So that's why instead of giving uh, subsidy for one particular type of fertilizer, we started, we, we have started giving subsidy based on nutrients so if uh, in urea there is nutrient for uh, nitrogen as well as potassium we will uh, give subsidy based on this particular nutrient so if in pnk subsidy for fertilizer subsidy is uh, uh, phosphate, phosphate is there we will give subsidy based on that particular nutrient not based on that particular fertilizer fertilizer concern okay so it uh, this nutrient based subsidy rates aims to rationalize subsidy rates clear okay? So according to this nutrient based subsidy rates, cabinet committee on economic affairs have approved a particular rate. Now what is that particular rate? 
that particular rate will be 18.90 per kilogram of nitrogen, 15.21 per kilogram of phosphorus, 11.21 per kilogram of potassium and 3.56 per kilogram of sulphur. So uh, based on this uh, nutrient based subsidy rates, the expanded expenditure for the release of subsidy for P and K fertilizer during 2019 to 20 period will be around 22,875 crores. Okay, so that's it. this is the background with respect to nutrient based subsidy rates. Now government provides fertilizers, urea, 21 grades of P and K fertilizers to farmers at subsidized prices. In accordance to its farmer friendly approach, the government is committed to ensure availability of P and K fertilizers to farmers at affordable prices. To make sure that P and K fertilizer also av uh, available to farmers at subsidized prices, that's the reason NBS scheme was used. Uh, now the subsidy on PNK fertilizers is being governed by NBS scheme from 2010 onwards itself. Okay. Since uh, then now you can ask this question since uh, uh, this NBS scheme is being followed from 2010 itself then what is the need for reintroduction of this fertilizer scheme. Now in 2019 apart from PNK based fertilizers nutrient based subsidy is also being covered for urea based, uh, urea -based fertilizer as well. Okay. So, apart from 2019, NBS scheme is being used for providing subsidies both for PNK based fertilizer as well as urea based fertilizers. Now, the next one is the nutrient based subsidy scheme. Now, what are the particulars of this particular scheme? See, this particular scheme is being implemented from April 2010 by Department of Fertilizers under Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers. Now this particular information is very important from Prudence's point of view. Why? Because so uh, uh, so if uh, UPSC is asking this question, fertilizers is a subject under Ministry of Agriculture. Now students will think that since fertilizers comes under the domain of agriculture, they will think that okay, obviously the natural option would be Ministry of Agriculture, but that's clearly wrong. Fertilizers come under the Department of Fertilizers, which will come under Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers. Clear? Now under nutrient based subsidy scheme, a fixed amount of subsidy decided on an annual basis is provided to each grade of subsidized phosphatic as well as potassium fertilizers depending on its nutrients content. Yeah. So that's how this scheme works. Now what is the, we will do an analysis of this particular scheme. Now this nutrient based subsidy scheme was sought to deregulate subsidy on non urea fertilizers and expected to reduce the subsidy burden substantially. While nutrient based subsidy scheme certainly did not lead any decline in subsidy on fertilizer, it did not lead to worsening of soil quality along with shortages of shortages and price increases to all three types of major nutrients namely nitrogenous, phosphoric as well as potassium fertilizers. See undesirable outcome has been the change in fertilizer mix because of indiscriminate urea usage. Because of indiscriminate use, urea usage against the recommended ratio of nitrogen, phosphorus, as well as potassium, potassium ratio of 4 is to 2 is to 1. In 2013, the ratio in Indian soils was around 8.2 to 3.2 to 1. So it clearly shows, shows that because of indiscriminate urea usage, the amount of nitrogen content in our Indian soil has increased dramatically. Okay. Now, what are the disadvantages of uh, this uh, increased nitrogen in uh, Indian soils? Whenever rains pour in this particular, uh, whenever rains pour in these particular fields, rains gets mixed up in this nitrogen, and this water will immediately join the nearby stream of the river. It will join in near into. So this. Increased nitrogen content in a particular river will also cause you will, will, will also cause algal bloom. This increased nitrogen concentration, which is coming from runoff rainwater into streams of river, this will increase nutrient contents in particular river water. This will cause algal bloom. Now there are a number of detrimental effects of algal bloom, like uh, uh, lack of decrease in fish population and uh, decrease in water quality. Decrease in, uh, decrease in penetration of sunlight into uh, fresh water. All these things are uh, side effects of increased algal blooms, which is a cause of increased nitrogen concentration in river water. Clear? So that's why we have to reduce the amount of urea that is being administered in 
uh, Indian soils for that rationalization nutrient based subsidy scheme was introduced. Now considering that the fertilizer, fertilizer subsidy is the second biggest subsidy of the food subsidy, the inaction on the part of government might adversely affect the health, fiscal health as well as soil health of this country. Since fertilizer prices follow the trend in international petroleum prices, the only way to reduce the subsidy bill is to reduce the dependence on imports and increase domestic production. Clear? If we uh, give subsidy based on uh, flat rates in urea, what will happen? Since domestic production cost is much higher compared to import cost, what will they do? They will import fertilizer more and more rather producing the producing fertilizer in our country itself. So we have to rationalize, rationalize this whole process so that we are dependent on a fertilizer which is product, pro, produced from Indian nation not from imported from other nations. While rationalizing fertilizer subsidy across nutrients may be a short term immediate solution to the problem, the need of the hour is to have a policy framework that incentivizes domestic production of fertilizers. So even though India scheme can give a short term phase with this uh, uh, skewed de demand as well as production needs. The need of the hour is to have a broad policy which addresses the need to increase our domestic production to meet our fertilizer demand. Now the biggest challenge when it comes to uh, Indian agriculture is to change the pattern of fertilizer usage itself. Now because of this uh, uh, subsidy which, is, which was given to urea alone, uh, farmers have been accustomed to use urea more and more. Now to change this pattern of administering urea more and more, it is very difficult. Okay, now clearly government has to prepare a policy to change the behavior of, behavior of urea administration itself. Now this not only involved, involves the revamping and re-energizing the extension services, but also changing the NBS suitably to remove the price distortion caused by it. Okay, now uh, what, what does a mutant based subsidy scheme do? It, 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 even though NBS uh, incentivizes farmers to use other types of fertilizers, even NBF, NBS incentivizes farmers to use particular type of nutrient fertilizers. Yeah, in NBS, what types of uh, nutrients are being subsidized? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur. But soil in soil, apart from macronutrients, there are number of micronutrients which is required for soil health. Now, Indian NBS is subsidizing farmers only for administering macronutrients, not for micronutrients. So, even though NBS, NBS can address our soil health for the short term, for the long term, we have to come up with a policy which changes the behavior of farmers, not only for administering both macronutrients, but also for micronutrients. Clear? That's the need for uh, bringing up policy for changing the behavior of farmers itself. Now this is a question, this is a UPC prelims question based on nutrient based subsidy scheme which we will uh, solve now. Now the question that we have asked in this particular uh, question is, the nature of the question is not correct. So we have, we have to identify which statements in this particular question are not correct. The first statement is, this particular scheme is being implemented by Ministry of Agriculture. As I mentioned before, I stress this particular point, whenever it comes to fertilizer, Fertilizer comes under the domain of Department of uh, Department of Fertilizers. Department of Fertilizers comes under the Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers. Clear? So this statement is wrong. Now look at the next uh, statement. Under nutrient-based subsidy scheme, a fixed amount of subsidy decided on an annual basis is provided on each grade of subsidized phosphatic as well as potassium fertilizers depending on its nutrient content. Now this particular statement is correct because that's the core of this NBS scheme itself. Now this scheme was sort of deregulate, deregulate subsidy on urea fertilizers. That statement is correct. So the answer is A, one only. Okay. So uh, I hope this particular topic was very clear to, clear to you. If you have any doubts with regards to this particular topic, uh, please don't hesitate to leave a comment uh, in the comment section and I and I'll try to solve those doubts. Okay, so excuse me. Now let's move on to the next topic. Now, the next topic that we'll be looking today is prevention of money laundering act. Now in this particular topic we will look at what are the recent amendments 
that have been brought forth to prevention of money laundering act and we will look at what is the concept of money laundering sorry what is the concept of money laundering and what are the prevalent routes uh, people use to launder money so all these things all these issues we will look into this particular topic now recently union government has issued a notification on certain changes in prevention of money laundering act which will further empower enforcement directorate in tackling cases of money laundering okay, now what are those proposed amendments now this amendment seeks to treat money laundering as a standalone crime clear okay, now before under prevention of money laundering act money laundering was seen as a predicate offense what is the meaning of uh, predicate offense which means that money laundering is a result of parent crime like for example money laundering is a result of terrorism money laundering is a result of child trafficking so money laundering was not treated as a separate crime but it was treated as a crime which was part of a bigger crime so that is a call that is called as a concept of predicate offense or scheduled offense now because money laundering was defined as a predicate offense uh, tackling money laundering cases was very difficult when it comes to enforcement directorate but to solve this issue this money laundering right now based on this amendment is being treated as an independent crime not an predicate offense here yeah. also this particular amendment expands the ambit of proceeds of crime to those properties which may directly or indirectly be derived or obtained as a result of any criminal activity relatable to the scheduled offense okay so uh, it expands the contours based on uh, the crime it expands the contours of crime activity when it comes to money laundering okay so uh, any money which is uh, obtained directly or indirectly from money laundering can be prosecuted okay the most crucial amendments are the deletion of provisions in subsections 1 of section 17 search and seizure as well as section 18 of search and uh, search of persons now these provisions require the prerequisite of fir or charge sheet by other agencies that are to be authorized to prove the offenses listed under pmla schedule so for example a person has uh, uh, indulged himself in money laundering scheme okay now if a person has been indulged in money laundering scheme what what, what which organization is dealed with did is tasked with dealing in money laundering enforcement directorate so enforcement directorate will uh, uh, deal with all cases with respect to money laundering so you have to do solve these cases effectively what should they have, what powers should the enforcement director have directorate have they should have the powers to search and seize seize persons uh, associated with money laundering but in in previous act what happened was that without obtaining an fir from other agencies without obtaining a fir from other agencies enforcement directorate did not have the power to search as well as seize persons related to money laundering now this was an obvious defect because of that number of money laundering cases was delayed indefinitely so this problem was rectified in this particular amendment okay now apart from these two provisions an explanation is also added to the section 45 that clarifies that all prevention of money laundering related offenses will be cognizable as well as non bailable now what is the meaning of uh, cognizable and non bailable the meaning of cognizable means that a person who is connected with money laundering can be arrested can be arrested without a warrant can be arrested without a warrant and if a person is being arrested under money laundering act money laundering crime this crime is non bailable he cannot obtain bail from judiciary okay and also they, therefore the enforcement directorate will be empowered to arrest and accuse without a warrant subject to certain conditions another vital amendment makes the concealment of proceeds of crime possession acquisition use projecting as an untainted money or claiming as an untainted untainted property as independent and complete offenses under act so not only it is expanding the definition of money laundering it is also including number of offenses which is being arise which which will arise out of money laundering into the ambit of pmla so if you are having some uh, black money with you okay what will you do you will try to convert this black money into white money this is called as money laundering 
Yeah. Now to convert this particular uh, black money to white money, it involves help from a lot of people. Now number of people will help you to convert this money from black money to white money and some certain people will pretend that this money is, even though this money is black money, they will prevent, they will say that this money is white people and they will use this particular money. So all these related crimes associated with money laundering has been criminalized under this particular amendment. Okay. Also section 72 will now give power to the center to set up an inter-ministerial coordination committee for inter-departmental inter-agency coordination for operational as well as policy level cooperation. So it is empowering central government to set up inter-ministerial cooperation so that they can tackle money laundering cases in a pan-India level very easily. Okay. Now, what is money laundering? So far, we have looked at uh, what are the amendments proposed to Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Now, what is the uh, concept? What is a uh, deed of money laundering? See, money laundering involves a process of making large amounts of money generated by criminal activity. Yeah, now, those criminal activities include drug trafficking, terrorist funding. Uh, now, these uh, funding appear to it will appear to have come from legitimate source. So even though they have received this funding from terror financing, drug trafficking, uh, child trafficking, all those illegal means, these funds will be made to appear that these funds have come from legitimate source. This is called as money laundering. Now, criminal activities such as illegal arms sales, smuggling, drug trafficking, prostitution rings, insider trading, bribery, computer fraud schemes, these, these uh, activities will provide large amounts of profits. Now these profits will generate large amounts of pro large amounts of money, which needs to be converted from black money to white money. So that's how money laundering money laundering comes into being. So thereby it creates incentive for money launderer to legitimize the ill gotten gains through money laundering. The money so generated is called as dirty money, and the money laundering is a process of conversion of dirty money to make it appear as legitimate money. Bulk cash smuggling cash incentive business, trade based laundering, shell companies and trash, round tripping, bank capture, gambling, real estate, black salaries, fictional loans, hawala, false invoicing are some of the most common methods of money laundering. So what are the ways based on which a person can money launder? These are the ways based on which a person can money launder. Okay. Now what is the legal framework in India to deal with money laundering? In India, the specific legislation in dealing with money laundering is the Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. Now, this particular law was enacted to combat money laundering in India and it has three main objectives. Now, what are those main three main objectives? Those include to prevent and control money laundering, that's the first objective. To provide for confiscation and seizure of property obtained from laundered money, that's the second objective. To deal with any other issue connected with money laundering in India. As I mentioned before, money laundering, uh, the money from money for money laundering comes from number of illegal activities. So not only that, are, not only the, this act has objective of dealing with money laundering, it also has objective of dealing with parent crime. Clear? Now under Prevention of Money Laundering Act, the Enforcement Directorate is empowered to conduct a money laundering investigation. So money laundering investigation is is will come under the ambit of enforcement directorate apart from the provisions of uh, prevention of money laundering act there are other specialized provisions such as rbi scba as well as insurance De regulation development authority anti money laundering regulation so apart from this particular act all these independent organizations such as rbi scba as well as irda has certain money laundering regulations okay now what is this body called as Enforcement Directorate? So we will learn about this body called as Enforcement Directorate. Now Directorate of Enforcement is a specialized financial investigation agency under the Department of Revenue which comes under Ministry of Finance, Government of India. Now it was formed on May 1 of 1956 as an enforcement unit in Department of Economic Affairs for handling exchange control laws violations under if uh, FERA Act of 1947. Now, in the year 1957, this unit was renamed as Enforcement Directorate. Now, Enforcement Directorate enforces two types of laws. Those two types of laws include Foreign Exchange Management Act 1999 and Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. Now, this is the information regarding Enforcement Directorate. 
Now this particular information can be very useful for UPSC prelims. Now let's take a look at question uh, which is related to uh, Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Now with reference to Enforcement Directorate, which of the following statements is or not correct? So the nature of this particular question is not correct. Clear? So let's take a look at this uh, particular statements and let's analyze which statements, which of these statements are not correct. Now look, look at the full statement. It's a specialized a financial investigation agency under Department of Financial Services in Ministry of Finance. See, under Ministry of Finance, there are a number of different types of departments. Now, what is the job of Department of Financial Services? It's in the name itself. The job of Department of Financial Services is to provide economic services for Ministry of Finance. So, they will prepare budget, all those things. Yeah. So, as I mentioned before in my previous uh, slide, Department Enforcement Director will come under Department of Revenue, not under Department of Financial Services. So, the first statement is wrong. Now, let at least take a look at the second statement. Second statement says that it enforces Foreign Exchange Management Act of 1999 and Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. Now, this particular information is correct. I mentioned in my previous slide itself, there are two laws which come under the ambit of Enforcement Directorate. One is FEMA, the next one is PMLA. Okay. Now, uh, let's take a look at the third statement. Third statement says that it is not empowered to arrest and accuse without a warrant under Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. Now, before this particular amendment, this statement was correct. Since this amendment was passed, this statement is currently wrong. So, what is the answer? The answer is D1 and 3 only. Okay. So, this is the, uh, this, uh, that's it with regards to this uh, amendments to uh, PMLA Act. I hope everything was crystal clear to you. If you have any doubts with regards to this particular topic, drop in the comments with your doubts and I will try to answer those doubts. Clear? Now uh, let's take a look at the next topic. The next topic that we will be looking today is 5 star movement. Now what is this 5 star movement? See, the reason why this particular, I have taken this particular topic is because Italy's Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte has announced his resignation on the account of collapse of his coalition between Five Star Movement and League Party. Now, because of this particular news, today we will be looking at Five Star Movement and what are the genesis of this Five Star Movement and what is the importance of this particular political party. Now, uh, in August 2019, League Party withdrew its support by stating that its political goal was to challenge Uni European Union's fiscal rules. Clear? Now, this clearly shows that there are a number of parties, number of parties which are on rise in European governments, which are uh, increasingly challenging the, challenging the status of European Union. And League Party is also one such party which is challenging the European Union's fiscal rules. Now, what is the problem with European Union's fiscal rules? See here, European Union is a union of number of European countries, Germany, Italy, France, uh, and then, uh, sorry, and then UK, not UK right now, uh, Austria, all these countries came together and they formed an uh, economic body called, uh, economic as well as political body called as European Union. Now, yeah, under European Union, there is a monetary union, but there is no fiscal union, which means that even though currency for all these currency as well as central bank for all these countries is the same bank, these countries will follow different types of fiscal rules. For example, Germany has a strong fiscal consolidation policy, which means that their debt is very low. But Greek, Greece has uh, a higher amount of fiscal deficit. Now, because of these differences between the fiscal rules of various governments under the European Union, in 2008, in 2008, when uh, financial sector broke down, Greece at the time borrowed a lot of Greece at the time borrowed a lot of money from European Central Bank. Now, because of this financial crisis, Greece was unable to make those repayments to European Union. 
Okay. Now, because of that, Greece economy collapsed, and the European Union, European Union Central Bank, Europe Central Bank, imposed a policy called as austerity. An imposed a policy called as austerity. Now, what is the meaning of this austerity policy? According to this austerity policies, number of government programs, number of uh, money spent on uh, the amount of money which was spent on government programs was cut drastically. Because of the social security schemes in Greece suffered greatly. Ordinary people in Greece suffered very much. So, uh, number of political parties as a result of this imposition of austerity started to challenge the fiscal rules of European Union. Now, one such party in Italy is called as League Party. Now, League Party recently broke away from the coalition of five star women, citing that they wanted to effectively challenge the fiscal rules of European Union, but, but we cannot challenge. Uh, based on the coalition of five star women clear so that's a uh, gist of this uh, breakdown in coalition between five star women and a league party now what's so special about this five star women see this five star movement is a populist movement which was started in 2009 as an internet based group becoming one of the most voted parties for all time in italy okay so it started as a it started primarily as an internet based group becoming as a political party now, this particular party was started by Pepe Gurillo and Gian Roberto Casaleggio through their social networking site called as meetup.com to bring people together to campaign on local issues and then to field candidates for their elections. Okay, so, this meetup, uh, uh, meetup website was started so that they can congregate number of people based on similar political beliefs and field candidates to the Italian elections. In 2013, it became the second largest political party and they eventually came to power in 2018. See, uh, this five star movement marked the significance of internet as well as social media based political parties. Now, it shows that internet as well as social media can support a new type of political parties. Now, uh, five star movement is certainly an example of that phenomenon. Five star movement used internet to form political party one without organization, money, ideology or headquarters. Okay. So, it kind of broke what are the traditional requirements to become a political party. So, if you want to if you want to start a political party, one thing which you require is money and then you, have, you should have an uh, ideology only based on the ideology you can recruit people and uh, MS5 for the first time, 5 star movement for the first time broke all those traditional rules of political party, forming a political party. Also, it adds a new dimension to the, uh, to the concept of populism. See, what is the meaning of this particular word, populism? Now, this populism is a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel that their concerns are disregarded by establishment elite groups. Yeah. So, if populism is a type of uh, political tool, political philosophy, which appeals to these disenfranchised people. Okay. For example, uh, because especially because of this corona, corona pandemic, number of people will be unemployed. Number of people will lose their jobs. So, what happens when un 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 unemployment rate as well as poverty level rises in a country, people will become very angry. Yeah. So, if people are becoming very angry, what will happen? There will be number of political parties which will try to tap this anger for their political gains. Now, that concept is called as populism. Yeah. So, now uh, this that's it with regards to this particular topic. Now, what type of questions can be asked from this particular topic? Questions like for, uh, recently, from especially from 2016, there is a trend in UPSC to start questions regarding certain types of political movements. For example, last year or so, there was, there was a question regarding umbrella movement. Yeah. So, questions regarding particular movements from around the world are being asked in UPSC prelims. So, uh, it is very important to know something about 5 star movement. Now, I hope this particular topic was very helpful for you. If you have any doubts regarding this particular topic, you can ask in the doubt section. Yeah. Now, the next topic that we will be looking today is Academic Lomosonau. Now, this Academic Lomosonau is a Russian ship, Russian ship that has a floating nuclear units. Clear. Now, what is the purpose of this protein nuclear units? The purpose of this protein nuclear units is to provide power to a particular uh, type of uh, 
any type of island or any type of uh, ship that is being attached to this particular ship. Okay. Now this uh, academic Lomoso now started its first journey from Russian port of Murmus, Mur Murmansa to the Arctic town of Tevek despite its supposition from environmental groups. Okay. Now this is the world's food, only floating power unit and the world's northernmost nuclear installation. Now in this particular topic we will look at what are the what is the need for having floating nuclear power plant and what are the concerns with regards to floating nuclear power plant. Now what is the significance of floating nuclear power plant? Now this floating, floating nuclear power plant is suited for powering remote areas and island states that require stable as well as green sources of energy. Now it will power the extraction of, uh, extraction of natural resources in Arctic region. See due to global warming, due, due to global warming, increasingly Arctic region is Arctic region is being melted. And uh, Russia wants to tap this uh, mining potential in this Arctic region. So to power extraction of uh, minerals from this Arctic region, we require power, right? Now this power will, will be provided by these floating nuclear power plants. The portable nuclear power plants will help to reduce emissions such as carbon dioxide that help in mitigating climate change. Okay. Now, apart from Russia, China as well as US are also working on so-called sea-based nuclear power plants and France has also explored the possibility. Now apart from Russia, what is the need for China as well as USA to have this floating nuclear power plants? Now in case of USA, these floating nuclear power plants are very important when it comes to powering their overseas powering their overseas military establishments so to power this overseas estab military establishment right now us uh, us military is using diesel generators but that's not sustainable in the long run so because of that us is currently exploring the possibility of using floating nuclear power units and also china is also vigorously rigorously exploring the possibility of having floating nuclear power power units mainly to construct mainly to construct artificial islands artificial islands in south china sea yeah if you uh, follow news regularly you might have come across news that china for the past few years have been artificially constructing uh, artificially constructing islands so that they can climb more uh, more sea territory out of south china sea now there are there's an ongoing territory dispute between philippines malaysia uh, Vietnam and China due to the demarcation of territorial demarcation in South China Sea. Now to increase their territorial claims, right now China is propping up artificial islands. Now apart from propping up these artificial, uh, artificial islands, we are also maintaining some military establishment. Now to give power to these military establishments, we require power source. Right? Now this power source will be provided by floating nuclear power units. Now, even though it has number of uh, users, environmental group Greenpeace has called this plant Chernobyl on ice because there is a possibility that because of uh, natural disasters, because of uh, uh, over flooding, all these issues, it's a possibility that there can be a possibility of nuclear contamination, nuclear leakage. If uh, nuclear leakage happens in the middle of the sea, the entire ecosystem, entire uh, sea ecosystem in that area will get permanently damaged. Yeah. So that's why a environmental group Greenpeace has called this particular plan as Chernobyl on ice. Now let's move on to the last topic of today, Genome India Initiative. See India is planning to launch its first human, first human genome mapping project. Now in this genome mapping project, India will be using a technology called as gene sequencing. India will be using a technology called as Gene sequencing. Gene sequencing. Now, what is this uh, technology? Gene, se gene sequencing. See, in every cell of human body, there are around 23 chromosomes. In every cell, there are around 23 chromosomes. Each chromosome has a DNA. Now, what is the what is the shape of DNA? The DNA has a kind of double helix structure. Double helix structure which means that it has a very spiral structure. Now, if you uh, uh, arrange this double field structure in a flat plane, it will come as, it will have a shape of ladder. It will have a shape of ladder. Yeah. Now, there are th 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 four types of proteins in DNA. 
this the four types of protein are called as AD CG clear AD CG so A type of protein can attach only with T type of protein G can attach only with C now there are different types of combinations of this ATCG arrangement okay now genome sequencing what they will do is that they will extract this DNA from number of individuals from 20,000 individuals and they will obtain the sequence in which this ATCG sequences are been arranged so after obtaining that information they will look at what are the anomalies what are the important sequences which is responsible for certain features for example uh, they will look at which feature is responsible for this particular birth defect so for example if a child has autistic uh, cap cap capabilities they will look they will look at which sequence is responsible for this autism if a particular person has cancer they will look at which sequence is responsible for this particular cancer here yeah, that's how genome sequencing works now this genome sequencing is being used for the first human genome project of india yeah. Now this uh, particular initiative is being implemented by Department of Biotechnology under Ministry of Science and Technology. Now what is the significance of this particular genome sequencing? Now in healthcare department for new advancements in medical science like predictive diagnosis and precision medicine, genomic information and disease management, genome sequences can play a very crucial role. Yeah. Uh, for a number of diseases like, diseases like Alzheimer's, uh, cancer even before these diseases attack a particular person we can predict this disease so uh, if we are predicting this before uh, if we are predicting these diseases before they are being attacked to a particular person we can prevent these particular diseases very effectively through genome sequencing methodology researchers and clinician, clinicians can easily detect the diseases related to particular genetic disorder so if a person has a particular genetic disorder, that genetic disorder can be solved effectively yeah? as well as genetic screening. The genome project will lead to improved techniques of genetic screening for diseases prior to birth. So even before a birth is give, a mother is giving birth to a particular child, we can effectively determine which are all the defects in this particular genome, genome sequencing. Also evolution by person. Genome, see, genome project may answer the question of regarding the evolution of comparing human DNA with primate DNA. So uh, by uh, sequencing our uh, genetic material, we can compare our gene with primate DNA. This uh, DNA with monkeys as well as chimpanzees so that we can analyze the evolution of human DNA itself. Now even though there are a lot of advantages with respect to uh, genome sequencing, there are a lot of concerns as well. Now what are the concerns with respect to genome sequencing? The first concern with respect to genome sequence is discrimination. Now discrimination based on genotype is possible as a consequence of genome sequencing. For example, employers may obtain the genetic information of employees prior to hiring them. For certain employees is shown to be genetically susceptible to certain undesirable uh, traits for his workforce, they may be discriminated against their genotype. For example, uh, the example that I have provided is if employers if, if you want to go to a particular job now if that uh, employer has data to your particular genome sequencing now even before you attend the interview itself they will analyze what type of uh, character, characters you will have what type of diseases are you susceptible to so based on this information there is a possibility that employers can discriminate you against okay? so that's one one concern with respect to genome sequencing now the next one is ownership and control Apart from the issue of privacy and confidentiality, the question of ownership and control of genetic information becomes very critical. Now, if employers can easily access your genetic information, there is no privacy at all, right? So, there should be an issue of who gets to own this particular information. Okay? If, uh, if this information is getting stored in public data bank, everyone can access this information. Uh, so, then that discrimination becomes widespread based on genetic sequencing. So, to prevent this from happening, the ownership issue has to be addressed before time, before itself. Also, fair use of genetic data for insurance, employment, criminal justice, education, adoption, military. This fair use of genetic data is very essential. Now, let's take an example in the insurance sector. Now, you know, what, what happens in the insurance sector? For example, if you are taking accidental insurance, if you are taking accidental insurance, in this accidental issue insurance, you are taking insurance saying that if a supposed accident happens to you 
uh, this insurance com company will pay certain amount of uh, for pay certain amount of money to your family now insurance company if they have access to particular genetic data what what can they do they will they can determine which persons are more susceptible to particular diseases which persons are more susceptible to uh, accidents all these things they can determine based on that they can vary the rates of their insurance offerings clear so there is a discrimination here itself based on genetic data so that to prevent that from happening we should have apply a practice called as fair use of genetic data so these are the concerns with respect to use of uh, genome sequencing i hope everything was clear to you now if you have any doubts with respect to this particular topic you can ask in the comment sections below not only that if you have any doubts with regards to any current affairs topics just drop in the comment section below i'll i'll try i'll try to answer those doubts so that's it with regards to this particular uh, topic let's take a look at this particular question now what what, what does this question ask about the first statement talks about india's first human genome mapping project will be implemented by the department of science and technology is this statement is this statement correct or not this statement is correct now the project involves scanning of 20000 indian genomes in order to develop diagnostic tests and effective therapies for treating diseases such as cancer is this statement correct yes that's the main objective of genome sequencing now look at let's take a look at third statement according to epidemiological transition level concept cancer patients started to decrease in india with an increasing of life expectancy what do, what is the meaning of this cancer patients started to decreasing as india's life expectancy started to increase now this statement is wrong because even though life expectancy in india is increasing cancer is also increasing in india why because cancer is a form of non communicable diseases and it's also a form of lifestyle disease clear so uh, as people becomes accustomed to more modern lifestyle incidence of cancer will increase because our food habits as well as our uh, daily habits are becoming more accustomed towards modern lifestyle because of that cancers cancers incidence is increasing among indians even though our like life expectancy is also increasing so now what is the uh, answer for this particular question the answer is c one and two only so because the third statement is wrong because cancer rate even though our life expectancy is increasing throughout cancer rate is also increasing in india clear now that's it with regards to that uh, this uh, today's video if you have any doubts ask in the comment section and don't forget to subscribe to an academy's csc english youtube channel and if you have any doubts just ask in the uh, ask in the comment section clear and don't forget to use my code aravind v aravind v if you are subscribing to an academy subscription platform thank you